Good morning, and welcome to the session on translating legal documents. Turns out the last T in Tagit stands for translation. Who knew? This will be a tag team presentation with my husband and business partner, Marco. My name is Margaret Hansen. We've been running a translation agency for about 13 years in Austin, Texas, and together we have translated thousands of legal documents uh, in Spanish, a little in French, maybe a few other. We've also uh, managed other translation projects for about 50 other different languages. Um, and for the last decade, we've been the sole translation provider for the State Bar of Texas. And for the last three years, the New Mexico Judiciary. Um, other clients we've had include the National Center for State Courts, uh, a variety of universities, senators, school districts, uh, think tanks, law firms, a lot of variety. Um, we are both from Brownsville, Texas, which is the southernmost tip right on the Mexican border, and we both uh, have been bilingual elementary school teachers before making the transition to being translators. We've put together something of a crash course in translation for interpreters. Probably everyone in this audience has done some written translation already, unless your languages are ASL and English. So think of this as an invitation to expand your translation services in new and profitable ways. We'll be comparing translation to interpretation, talking about credentials that translators might need, types of documents you'd be asked to translate, how to evaluate requests from prospective clients, what kind of terms, conditions, and rates are standard and reasonable in the business, software and terminology resources that will help you in researching your project, the art of translation or some of the specific skills that uh, translators are trained and tested on and that you should be trying to develop as your career proceeds. Certification statements that accompany a lot of legal and official translations and also teamwork preparing for the types of orders where you need to collaborate with other translators and proofreaders and project managers to crank out more words faster and meet that deadline. So why translate? If you're already a professional interpreter, you've already got a pretty good gig, but you also already have 90% of the skills you need to be able to translate. And while there are different pay scales for different kinds of translation and interpretation, it is possible to earn more per hour as a translator than as an interpreter, depending on the client, the project, how you approach it. If the clients that you interpret for sometimes need written translation, you could expand to cover that service for them as well. It's easier for them to send both kinds of work to you than to try to go out and find and break in a new provider. And it's usually easy to convince them that uh, somebody that you're already interpreting for that you can also translate because outsiders don't really differentiate between translation and interpretation. They use the terms interchangeably a lot of times and don't really know the difference. So of course you can do both. Also, having worked in legal settings already, you've got an edge over other translators because you are familiar with legalese. You understand words that have multiple meanings and obscure meanings sometimes, like serve. Think about how differently you would interpret or translate serve in these two different contexts. The contract simply doesn't serve our purposes versus the defendant was served on August 1st. The first, serve our purposes, is a synonym for fulfill or suit, while the second, the defendant was served, means that a representative of the court delivered official papers, like a summons. Other common words with special meanings in the legal system that trip up uninformed translators, but not court interpreters, are words like file, meaning to present a, a request to the judge for action, not to store papers away in a cabinet, or party, not a celebration, not a political party, but the person named in a lawsuit. Interpreters who translate are able also to fill in gaps in their schedule, both while waiting at home for your next Zoom call or while sitting in the jury box at court waiting for your case to be called on the docket. Sometimes this allows you to earn money from translation clients 
while you're on the clock for interpretation clients. So either way, it's more billable hours per year, higher income. Translation calls for research, which will enrich your interpreting vocabulary. So that's, that's giving you multiple benefits there. And it also forces you to analyze complex grammar and improve your skills at pulling meaning out of complex convoluted sentences. Now, written language tends to use longer words, longer sentences than spoken language. It also tends to use less common words, but more complex grammar. So there's that, but the barriers to entry are low. As long as you have a computer or could borrow one, you could start today. There will be costs, you know, for software, marketing, so forth, but taking the plunge, free. And like our happy model in this slide and our little stock photo here, you could work from a sunny beach in your favorite country as long as you have a data connection available for your computer. And while the pandemic has made all of us less tied to a specific work location, you still can't interpret with the surf crashing in the background. But you can work from a different time zone on the other side of the world as long as you don't keep them waiting too long on replies to emails. So some caveats. Margaret's gone over the pros. These are the cons. Um, full disclosure here. Translators are writers and writers are readers. If you don't consider yourself a writer or a reader, think long and hard about whether translating is good is a good match for you. Also, um, when you're going through school, did you enjoy your writing classes? Did you hate them? Is it a chore? And just because something is a chore doesn't mean you can't learn to do it as part of your job, but it, it, you might have to work a little bit harder to find the joy in it. Translation and interpretation also appeal to different personality types. And at the risk of oversimplifying, I feel that interpreters tend to be more extroverted. They like dealing with other human beings face to face and translators tend to be more introverted. They like sitting in a quiet room with a cat on their lap and a cup of coffee and just digging deep into dictionaries by themselves for hours on end with nobody bothering them. If you are sort of a mix of the two, maybe you'll want to interpret for a while until you just get tired of all the people and then you want to take some translation orders for a while and being able to switch back and forth is nice variety. It helps keep the work fresh and interesting. Um, it's easier to get socially isolated as a translator since everything's done by email. And so if you um, translate long term, then you have to cook up excuses to get out and socialize with people and put in an extra effort that you wouldn't as an interpreter where you're automatically put into either physical or virtual contact with the people you work for and you interpret for. So another difference uh, or another warning is that there's more competition in general for translation work because there are more translators out there than interpreters and they can be anywhere in the world so it's a larger pool of competitors that you're up against and so it may take longer to find your niche and stand out from the competition find those clients who like your work enough to keep paying you and coming back to you and fi finding clients for all of these freelance positions like translation and interpretation you spend a lot of time in the beginning just establishing yourself showing that you're reliable and figuring out where those needles in the haystack are because it's a big haystack and there's a lot of needles, but they're very small. And you don't want all those needles, you want certain ones. This, this analogy can only go so far. <laughs> but um, trying to find the people who are willing to pay what you need to earn to make a living um, means that you do a lot of marketing in the beginning and then hopefully as the years go by with more and more repeat business and referrals, you can spend more time actually on billable work than on just trying to market your services. So we've covered why to translate and maybe why not to, um, but how do the two jobs compare? So both are going to draw heavily on your fluency in two or more languages and your broad knowledge of the cultures involved and your detailed knowledge of certain technical fields like law, for example. Um, both also are made up of logo files people who love words. We are such word nerds. Our kids are word nerds. We love it. And probably you are the same way. Um, we like to share 
intelligent, red, nerdy quotes on social media. We make fun of bad grammar in ads. We're the people that, that carry Sharpies with us so that we can fix signs that are done wrong. We like to play Scrabble, crosswords, things like that. Also, both are part of this ever expanding gig economy. People who work from gig to gig, job to job, instead of having a steady paycheck twice a month. So that's how they're similar. There are differences, of course. Um, some key differences being that you're more flexible with translation in terms of schedule and location because it's asynchronous. You don't have to be in a deposition or connected to a video at the same time as the council and witnesses. You just have to be reachable by email in a reasonable amount of time. Also, translation pays by the word instead of by the hour. So whether, whether you translate fast or slow, it's by the word. So the faster you translate, the more you can make. Um, and by word count, um, when I talk about being paid by the word, there, there's a total number of words usually in the source document because you already have that information. You already know how many words are in the source document. You don't know how many words you're going to end up translating into in your target language. So it's easier to calculate at the beginning of a job the number of words in the document, or if you're dealing with a logographic language like Chinese, how many characters. And so that's how you, you figure out your um, what, what a job is going to cost. Um, and as you improve, well, as an interpreter, you are limited by the number of hours in a week that clients are available, uh, that they're awake using your services, that courts are open. No matter how supernatural your stamina is, there's a limit to how many hours other people are available for you to interpret for. But as a translator, there is no cap as to how many words per week you can build for. And when you start leveraging things like computer assisted translation, which we'll talk about a little bit later, or a team of translators, you can really maximize time and, and make a lot of money in, in hours that you can't as an interpreter. Um, and then another difference, which is kind of a con here, is that um, Translation is a little bit more threatened by, by technology than interpretation. Um, machine learning is evolving into science fiction. The, the robots that are smarter than people and are going to take over the world, right? Um, and that's going to happen with written translation before it happens with spoken language interpretation. Um, if you think about the rambling testimonies, that you've had to interpret where people are starting and stopping and they're mumbling or they're being vague. Um, that's really hard to interpret. And even if it would be hard to, in, to translate the written transcript of it, that's still going to be easier than an audio recording of all that stopping and starting and hemming and hawing and vague and mumbling. So that's harder for artificial intelligence to figure out the human brain is a high-tech marvel designed for communication and so the interpreting job is is a little bit more secure in that area in our opinion yeah who, knows, who knows what the future holds so qualifications and credentials um i hear a lot from uh, translation students that i would like to be a translator but I, i'm not certified so this this slide is to burst that myth burst bust Pop. Yeah. Um, in the world of translation credentials in the United States, it's the wild, wild west. Exhibit A, John Wayne. Um, there is no credential. In a word, there's no credential. It depends on the client, the end user, and uh, the country that the translation is going to. So for most of our translations is documents from other countries coming to the United States. The United States has no federal credential for sworn translators or judicial translators. There are interpreter credentials that don't test you over your translation skill. Site translation, but that's not really the same thing. And so the closest thing that we have in the US to a translation credential is the American Translators Association Certified Translation 
uh, credential and a given language pair and direction. Like I'm certified by the ATA from Spanish into English. And so if I want to translate English into Spanish, I have no credential for that. It's a, it's a one directional thing, unlike interpreting, which is always bi-directional. So if you have that credential, um, you can anybody can test and, and try to earn that. It's a difficult test. Most translators don't have the ATA certification in the US, but if you get it, that's great. Put it on your resume, put it on your LinkedIn profile, mention it in your certification statement and try to leverage that. But almost nobody requires it. Um, 98% of the translation I do is, it's irrelevant to them that I have the ATA certification. Certain um, foreign credential evaluation services require it if an outsider translates something rather than one of theirs. No government entity has ever required it. Sometimes when I'm applying for a major contract, they will that'll be a plus, but it's it's not a requirement. So if you have a degree in any language related to field, that's good, especially if it's translation or interpretation. Put that uh, in your marketing materials. But mostly the way you establish yourself as a professional legal translator is how you brand yourself. And branding yourself as credible and reliable, it starts with what is your email address? Does your email address you know end in an old domain like AOL.com that, that advertises, I'm not up to date when it comes to technology. No offense for all those, my friends out there who still have AOL email addresses. Does it have a bunch of uh, numbers after it that makes it look like your email address was just randomly generated? Um, in your emails, is there a signature line down at the bottom that uh, gives your title as something like professional translator or uh, court interpreter and legal translator or um, French translator? Uh, is there contact information so people can look you up and stalk you online and make sure you're legit and you're not sketchy? You, you need to be on LinkedIn and it's a good idea to put your LinkedIn uh, profile um, logo in your signature. Um, join professional associations like Tagit and be in the online directory in ways that people can get a hold of you and verify that you are a professional translator. And all those little, um, they're called like credibility indicators are the way that potential clients will screen you before they consider sending work to you. And if they're happy with the first translation you do, you can be sure they're going to come back because nobody likes bothering hunting down a new provider when they can just go back to the one they've used before. And everybody's always happy to refer a services provider that they've been happy with. And so that's how you build up um, to the point where you're doing more actual translation and interpreting than marketing is through the repeat business. So when a prospective client approaches you with a request for your translation services, so they've, they've seen you somewhere, they've, they've managed to find you, um, you may not be sure what they're asking you for. So you, you see on this slide, we've got a list of terms that they may throw out and they may or may not know what the terms mean either. Um, so what I have listed here is what most people mean when they say these things, but you're gonna to wanna to clarify. Um, so we've got professional. So professional, as we know, means that you paid someone to do a job. So a professional translator is someone who works for pay, not just your cousin back in the homeland who teaches English and volunteered to help, okay? But it's a vague term and it doesn't really mean anything. Um, official translation, slightly more specific, um, this often means uh, you're translating government documents or that you are a translator with a government credential. And this is often employed by people who need a translation to a foreign government who have government credentials. We do not, as Marco explained, we don't have that in the US, but other countries do. Um, and so the next one is a sworn translator, and that is, is one term that some governments use. A sworn translator is one, one term for someone who has been given that government credential. Um, a certified translator is what we often refer to in the US, and what we mean by that is there is a certification statement included with the translation just attesting to the accuracy of the work done by the translator. Um, I would point out that this is the accuracy of the translation, the work that you did, that you did your best, and that you actually speak these languages. 
you're not attesting to the accuracy of the original document, of the source document. There may be errors in it. There may be, it, it may not even be a, a legitimate document. That's not what you're attesting to. You are not um, bound in your certification statement for any of the original information. You're just attesting to your to the quality of your translation. You don't even have to see the physical copy that it came from. Right. Yeah, it, it may or may not be, like I said, may or may not be a legit document, but that's not your concern. Your concern is, is your translation accurate? Did you do the best job you could there? Uh, notarization, um, a word about notarization. Um, in the U.S., it's, it varies state by state what kind of qualifications you need or what kind of training you have to become a notary. In the state of Texas, pretty much nothing. You sign up and get your stamp and there's very little involved. I'm a notary. Yes. Are you a notary? I am a notary. Um, and I actually did go to a conference and learn stuff about it, but, but you don't have to. Anyway, in other countries, a notary is a bigger deal. There, maybe you have to be an attorney to be a notary, or there, there are other credentials that you have to hold. Um, but in the US, what notarization means is that the person signing a document, for example, a certification statement, appears before the notary public and presents identification, proving who they are, and then signs the document and the notary says, yep, that's the person that signed the document and they put their stamp and signature on it as well. Um, so you're, you're, the notary is notarizing your signature as a translator. That's it. Um, it's not, they are not notarizing the document per se. They're not notarizing that the translation is correct or that it's any good or that the, the document is useful in any way. They are just notarizing your signature. They're verifying your identity. Um, Apostille is, uh, the, so Hague Convention 1961, uh, certain countries were involved in the Hague Convention and agreed on a list of information that they want to, to go with documents that are moving from one country to another. And so the Secretary of State is the only person that can, can issue an apostille. The Secretary of State's office is in Austin, Texas, for the state of Texas, um, and they're the only ones that can issue an apostille. I can't do it, you can't do it, just the Secretary of State's office. Um, and some documents for international use require an apostille. Um, that's one of the questions you would want to ask your client. Um, make sure that they know whether or not their document needs that. And there are countries who are not, so like Mexico, if I, if, if I ask my client, here's my doc, this document that's a uh, Texas birth certificate going into Spanish, if it's going to Mexico, it's going to need an apostille. If it's going to Cuba, they're not part of the Hague Convention, so it would get something called an authentication. It's still through the Secretary of State's office, but you would need to know what country it's going to if, if they say they need an apostille. And then finally, um, evidentiary material. Um, that just means it's being used in court as evidence. And the rules for that depend on the jurisdiction, the preference of the judge and counsel, whether or not it needs to be certified, notarized, things like that. So again, talk to talk to your client about who is ending up with this document, who is ending up with the translation, and what they're going to need for it. Next, we'll look at some of the common types of documents that we get for our legal translation orders. Some of these tend to come from individuals, and some of them tend to come from organizations such as courts or law firms. First are the vital statistics records, birth certificates, marriage, death, divorce, then evidentiary materials such as affidavits, maybe written by somebody whose language is not English, but that needs to be filed in a US court. Text messages, these might be conversations um, on a messaging app between a perpetrator and a victim that are gonna be entered as evidence in a trial. Transcriptions, which are the written form of audio and video recording, sometimes of a dash cam or a body cam or a wiretap, a recorded phone call. And then on the academic side, we see transcripts, diplomas, degree certificates. For vehicles, we get titles and driver's licenses. And incidentally, driver's licenses, at least for most Texas counties we've dealt with, need to be notarized certified translations, not just certified translations. I don't know why, that's, that's been the preference of most 
local DMV offices. Yeah, DMV, DPS, passport offices all want notarizations on yeah. things. While the immigration people at U.S. Customs and Immigration don't care. They haven't asked for notarizations for years now. Then in the real estate business, we see titles and contracts. And for businesses, there are forms and manuals and other contracts. And all of these are different kinds of legal translations that you might run across depending on your language pair, your language direction, where you work, what circles you move in. So maybe you'll get a lot of these. Maybe you'll just um, specialize in a couple of them. But I think it's a good idea, at least early on in your translation career, to accept as many orders as you possibly can to um, broaden your skills and get a feel for what you like translating. I, for example, don't like doing transcripts. To me, they're they're deathly dull and take too much research. <laughs> Margaret's into transcripts. I like them. I think it's fascinating to see all the different courses someone takes to earn a degree in a certain area and all the things that they had to learn to get to that point. I just think it's very interesting to know what other people have studied to get where they are. Here we go. So you've listed yourself in a directory, as Marco mentioned, you're, you're going to want to put yourself into a, a, um, an online directory as a translator, and that's great. Now you're going to start getting offers. People are going to start finding you and saying, please translate for me. But it also means spammers are going to find you too, and they're going to send you junk offers, and you have to be able to figure out, is this a legit request for translation work or is this spam and is somebody trying to take my money so you need to you need to evaluate that figure it out um, if you're getting emails for large translation orders with very appealing rates especially if they're wanting to pay you by check be wary, red flags, Wait. yes, run in the other direction. Um, and I say checks because there, there's there's a common scam where they, they want to pay you by check and so you deposit the check and, and then they cancel the order and they just ask for half back because you know, you've already started the work and, and so then you pay them real money and give them half the money back and then a, a few days later, turns out the check was no good and then it bounces and it's just a mess so try not to be paid by check um, anyway um, other red flags though that are common that that you would look for in in any email that you're receiving I hope uh, things like look at the sender's email address is it odd uh, like Mark was saying lots of numbers or the email address doesn't actually match the company that they say they wi they're with um, do they want to pay you right away and, and it seems like a large amount of money. Real clients never want to pay you right away. <laughs> and they never want to pay you much. Um, and if they say that they're a professional email, but there's a lot of typographical errors, formatting weirdness, um, they want to hire you, but they haven't actually mentioned what language they need or asked you what languages you translate. Um, and if you're not sure, there are online forums, professional associations where you can share what what you got and just say hey does anybody know anything about this company or does this look legit and often other people will say oh i got that same email it's garbage walk away so that's very helpful um but let's say you've decided okay this is looking kind of legit i'm going to follow through with this um there's information you need to know to decide if this is a project you want to take on so language pair and direction it needs to be <laughs> languages you speak <laughs> otherwise pass it on to a colleague um, and as marco mentioned earlier unlike interpreting where you're going back and forth between two languages translation tends to only go into your native language there are people who can do both but they are they are rare and beautiful things and most of us go only into our native language maybe from two or three or four other languages but into our native language um, look at the length of the document hopefully they are giving you the actual document they want translated before you quote a final price you want to see the actual final version of the document that they want you to translate 
not the draft where they then later stick in thousands more words. You want to know what you're actually going to be translating. Um, and so how long is it and how, how much time do you have to do it? Um, people will often say that it's short and easy or just a few words and it won't take very long. Um, it's never true. <laughs> it, and, and sometimes I think that they genuinely just don't understand what it is that you're actually going to be translating, that you will be translating everything on the page, not just the, you know, the name and the birth date and where your parents were born, but every seal, every signature, every, everything on the page is going to be translated. And so they may look at it and say, oh, it's just 50 words that are really important. And it may be true, but it's not up to you as the translator to decide which words to translate. You translate the whole thing, and it's really 375 words. And that's a big difference in time and cost. Um, also, clients often need things really fast. They're in a big hurry until they find out that it's going to cost twice as much to have it done in two days as it will to have it done in five. And suddenly they realize, oh, they're really not in that big of a hurry. Maybe they could wait until next week to get it. So discuss deadline. Topic, if it's something you feel like you can do or you feel like you can research, that's great. Go big or go home, right? But it's also okay to say, I just really don't know what's going on here. I, I'm not familiar enough with this. You know, if, if, if you were good at high school algebra, but a dissertation on computational analysis feels a little out of your league, it's okay to say, mm, I don't feel like this is a project I, I can take on. That's fine. Um, we talk a lot about the end user. Um, who's it going to, if it's going to US Customs versus the Venezuelan consulate, that's gonna make a difference in the amount of work you're putting in and, and what it's gonna look like when it's done. If it's going, if it's a PTA newsletter or a major trade journal, that's going to inform how the, the register that you're using and the formatting that you're using and, and various things that you're, you're using in your uh, translation. So, um, and then what is the client's budget? Uh, translation agencies are a middleman who necessarily take a cut of the profit because they need to pay their translators and they're doing the marketing and the legwork. And so it can be an advantage to work with a translation agency. But if you're working directly with the client, you may be able to charge a little more than you would get paid by a translation agency, but less than the translation agency would charge. So um, what's, the, what, what's their budget? Um, how much are you charging per word? Or are they saying this is how much we're willing to pay? Um, or maybe they are looking to offer you a pro bono opportunity and you want to know that up front. If, if this is a chance for you to improve your translation skills and gain exposure, you want to know. And that's fine. If you want the practice or this is an organization that you respect, a cause you believe in, great. I'm not saying don't do that. Do, absolutely. But you want to know that you're not going to get paid for it before you start the work. So terms and conditions. Margaret talked about um, some things you want to know before you dive into a new order. And once you've decided what your arrangements is going to be, you need to get it in writing. That means not over the phone, not in a face-to-face -face conversation with a coffee shop, not through WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or texting. Those aren't really in writing. In writing means email. Get it in email and a single email that includes these uh, factors, what the rate's going to be, and you can research this online. We can't recommend rates, but most languages in the U.S. right now are going from 18 to 25 cents a word, depending on how um, many translators there are to meet the demand. Um, with Spanish, it's at the lower end. With something like Japanese, it's at the higher end. So list your per word rate in the email. Uh, list your turnaround time and try to get a feel for whether that is their turnaround goal or whether that's a hard deadline. And if it's a hard deadline, you can't blow it. The biggest way to lose a customer and not have them come back to you next time is to turn in the translation late. Um, find out who the end user is going to be and list that in the agreement email. 
And if it's an individual, charge in advance. We charge 100% in advance for individual orders and organizations that we're unfamiliar with. Sometimes they come back and ask us if we can do 50% up front and 50% after the fact and share the risk, and we're usually comfortable with that. If it's a repeat uh, client that we trust, then we can um, do the translation without charging and then invoice them net 50, and um, they are net generally... 30. I, I invoice net net fifteen actually, okay. um, and trust net that they twenty seven and a half. <laughs> trust that they will pay us, and so all of these details can be boiled down into what amounts to an informal contract, but it's really just an email. And here is a sample. I'm going to leave that up on the screen for a second so you can read through it. You'll see that it includes the word count, the type of document, the languages the end user, the fee, how you will be paid, and that depends a lot on what means this particular client has for paying, um, what the turnaround time is, what the review process is. You want to give your client the chance to look over it, and hopefully they won't catch any mistakes, but they might. You might have made a mistake, and maybe they'll find things that they would have said differently, and then you enter into this awkward negotiation where they're trying to get you to use certain terms that you wouldn't have used and you have to decide is that objectively a good translation, an alternate, and do they have good reason to ask me to change it? Maybe because inside their profession there's this term of art that other people will be expecting to see in the translation. And in that case you can say, sure, I'll change that because I've researched it independently and I'm comfortable with your synonym. Um, but have some mechanism for how you're going to do that and then cut it off. We'll have one round of review, I'll send you the PDF. Not a Word file that you can change, but a PDF that you can comment on. And then you'll send it back. I'll make any changes that are reasonable that you've requested, and then I'll send you the final version, and that's where the deal ends. And then if they reply to the email and say, yes, that's fine, go ahead, send me the payment link, or you know, please wait until I come by and drop off the payment, or the checks in the mail, um, whatever you've agreed to, watch out for checks. Um, then that constitutes, as I understand, I'm not a lawyer. You're a lawyer, I'm not a lawyer. Not a lawyer. But as we understand, that constitutes a written contract of a simple kind, and it's always been enough for us to um, uh, alleviate disagreements later on about what the deal was. And having it all in one place in emails that you can both share and refer to is much better than having it spread out in different apps and different forms of communication and then having disagreements later on yeah. about what you said you were going to do when and for how much. And I do want to say, um, when you're discussing how much they're going to pay you and how they're going to pay you like this much through Venmo, make sure that you include whatever handle or information they need to be able to pay you. If you need to give them your Venmo identification or your your bank's routing number or this is the make the check payable to this person at this address, make sure they have all the information they need to be able to give you money so that they can give you the money. Make it easy for people to give you money, just sort in of general. Yeah, yeah life a, advice there. Yeah, hashtag pro tip. Okay, uh, software and technology. Uh, we've talked about this just for like a half second earlier. Um, there are, if you hate computers, you may want to reconsider entering the field of translation. Uh, it may be a little challenging for you to start off with you're going to be doing a lot of things with email, but also just you're going to have to use a word processor like Microsoft Word. Um, and I recommend a word processor that you have to pay money for like Microsoft Word. Free things like, like Google Docs are great, but they have very few features. And if, you're, if it's just straight up text, that's fine. But if you have to do any kind of formatting or anything kind of a tiny bit fancy, it, it, it shortcomings crop up quickly. Um, there are uh, lots of good, um, what we call machine translations, uh, things like Google Translate. Google Translate is not, in fact, the devil because it can render simple, common translations of words uh, or small phrases or even sentences when it's dealing with straightforward information. If you're dealing with um, idiomatic expressions or less common usages of words like we discussed earlier like party 
it's always going to re render party as fiesta or or festejar or sorry foreign languages um it's going to it's going to choose the common translation rather than the uncommon one and it's going to get muddy quickly um but they can help with small phrases so so don't be afraid of them don't don't never use them um computer assisted translation also called cat tools can be very useful when you're dealing with um if, if you're working with a client that that is sending you similar documents or the same kinds of documents frequently often there are phrases that can be uh reused again and again because some of the information changes but big chunks of the information doesn't change and so computer assisted translation tools are like you know how these days in email you start typing something and it auto populates a possible phrase for you like you start to type um i look for and it says forward to hearing from you and it just pops that up and if you hit tab it'll just throw out the rest of the phrase for you that's kind of what uh, computer assisted translation tools do you put in the the phrase in language a and it spits out the phrase in language b that you have used previously for that same phrase and says you want to use this one again and if you do you're like yeah that was fast and easy now because there is a human involved in the process it's far more accurate but also faster than using something like Google Translate. It can be a great tool. Um, there are also a lot of online tools available like Lingui. We've got listed here, lingui.com, wordreference.com, prose.com, or pro -Z. I'm not sure how to say that, um, which are combo dictionaries and forums. So you've got, um, you can put in a word or a phrase or a sentence and find just a straight up definition if it's available. But if it's something kind of weird, there will be professional translators in South America who, who are familiar with the legal system in Venezuela who have already figured out how to say this certain thing in American English. And so you can do a search on one of these websites and they will help you find what you need. Then of course, uh, language specific things, the RIE is, is Spain's Kind of official dictionary if you will um, and so language specific for you for your uh, language pair and country specific information sometimes you can find that online and then writing styles style guides for your target language we don't all do things the same just because we're talking about the same idea for example money currency is your dollar sign going to go in front even if we're, de we're dealing with us dollars do you in your language does the dollar sign go in front of the currency amount or afterward or is there a space between the dollar sign and the number or no space uh, do you put the comma inside the quotation marks or outside the quotation marks or do you use quotation marks or maybe use those little carrot things it, writing styles are different and you need to know how to write in the target language, not just the source language. The rules can be different. And so there are lots of resources available to help you make sure that you're writing well in your target language. Now let's uh, get into a little deeper of the idea of translation as an art. I remember this is not science that we're doing. This is mostly art and there's never more, there's always more than one correct way to translate something. And so uh, these uh, suggestions are taken from an exam guide published by the American Translators Association, and they highlight some of the main areas that people who are trying to become ATA certified translators mess up on and keeps them from passing the exam. And so the three general areas are the target language, grammar, spelling, and punctuation. So for me, going from Latin American Spanish into US English, that would be English, um, grammar, spelling, and punctuation. Meaning transfer is the same idea present in the translation as it was in the source document, and writing ability. Is the final translation readable that sound like a native speaker and not a machine talking? So getting down into a little bit more detail, uh, in your target language, the grammar needs to be spot on, your spelling and punctuation need to be correct, and your uh, spell check feature and grammar check features in Word will help with that, but it's not always sure. Sometimes there are two options and they're both correct depending on the connotation and the computer's not sure which it is. So it's not enough to just trust that autocorrect will 
um, cover up all your mistakes. And then in meaning transfer, um, like in interpreting, there are lots of ways to lose meaning between the two languages, and you always use a little bit of meaning. I, I don't think any translation is ever 100% complete um, of what it was in the original language, but you want it to be 95 plus percent uh, complete, not leave anything out, not add anything. Make sure that your verb forms are as close as you can get to parallel. If I say, I would have been going to go in one language, you have to find some verb tense that's kind of like I would have been going to go in the other language. And you can't just say, I went, because I went is not the same as that I would have been going to go. And so sometimes that takes a, a detailed study to figure out what exactly does this mean and what's as close as we can get in the target language. And I am so glad I am not having to interpret you saying would have been going to go so fast. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. And then ambiguity, faithfulness, literalness, these are all elements of um, how much uh, meaning you're able to transfer from one language to another. Let's say in the source language, you have a different name for um, my mother-in-law, who is my wife's mother, versus my mother-in-law. No, I only have one mother-in-law. Let's say sister-in-law. My sister-in-law, okay. who is my wife's sister, versus my sister-in-law, who is my brother's wife. Maybe in the source language, that's two different words. And going into English, that's fine. You just collapse it into the word sister-in-law. But if you're going the other direction and you get into um, the language that has to be either this word or that word, depending on which kind of sister-in-law it is and you don't know, then you have to make decisions as a translator based on your knowledge of the context and the entire document and the social milieu about which one of those types of sister-in-laws it is, trying to avoid a, a, a translator's note in there that just muddies the water. Um, but those are, those are challenges that come up in translation that you think about more in translation because you have more time to dwell on the details than you do in interpreting when you're just rushing through to try to keep up with that judge who speaks at 120 words a minute. So down to writing ability, um, don't make it sound like translation ease. Don't make it sound like a foreigner struggling in a second language. Make it sound like uh, the natural way that somebody would speak in that language if they had lived there in that country their whole lives, been educated there, and that was the only language that they spoke. Because, again, with translation as opposed to interpretation, the reader has more time to dwell on the details, and it's probably going to be more critical um, because he or she can go back over it and reflect. And there's a higher bar for uh, using a natural style in the target language than there is for interpreting. Okay, so certification statements. Um, so, sometimes you will be required to include a certification statement with your translation. Uh, not always, but often. And they tend to include uh, certain pieces of, of information, um, always going back to the end user. Who is receiving this? What do they want the certification statement to include? Sometimes it, there are requirements of what it has to have. USCIS requires certain pieces of information to be included in the certification statement. Otherwise, generally speaking, you want to know who the translator is and a way to contact that person. Uh, email or uh, physical address uh, usually good. Um, what is the document that's being translated? Just throw out a mention that this is a, a birth certificate from Mexico, for example. A declaration that you did your best to be complete and accurate. You translated the whole thing, you speak these languages, and, and you did your best, okay? And then you need to sign it and date it. If a notary is required, a notarization is, needs to be on there, um, you cannot notarize your own signature. As, as I mentioned earlier, a notarization is verifying the identity of the signer, and you can't do that for yourself. That has to be a third party. And so don't write your little certification statement, this is all complete and accurate, and then put your notary seal in there. Eh, it's not the way it works. I think we have a sample certification statement on the next slide. Okay, so here's one. This is not what I usually use, but this is a, a good little sample. Um, you can, if you've got some kind of letterhead for your official translation business, then you can have a lot of this information just in the letterhead. It says the name of, of Margaret Hansen Translations and what your address is, or in my case, Texan Translation, you throw the address and, and contact information in there. You could also have a title at the top of the certification statement saying, 
uh, certified translation of a Mexican birth certificate. You could even put the Spanish and English part in there. Or you just write a little sentence here. I, Margaret Hansen, certify I am qualified to translate this Mexican birth certificate from Spanish to English and that it is complete and accurate to the best of my ability. So there might be a mistake in there, but I did my very best. I know these languages. I sign and date. And then if there is, if notarization is required, um, you have this statement on there and you appear before the notary. Um, sign in front of the notary uh, depending on the kind of statement that's on there you sometimes don't have to but it's better to just wait and sign in front of the notary so lastly we're going to touch on your team when you have to work with somebody else most freelance translators start out working by themselves but you quickly realize the value of having uh, colleagues to help you out in different situations one is proofreading. First of all, after you finish the translation, go back and proofread it very carefully, and you're going to find some mistakes, fix them yourself before it gets any further. And if you have the luxury of time, set it aside for 24 hours and then proofread it, and have the original and the translation open on your screen, run your finger down to follow along and see if you can find anything that you skipped out, any words or little details that you didn't include. And so all translations need to be proofread by the translator like that, no matter how big of a hurry you're in. But then most translations, especially for anything that's uh, new, challenging, different, uh, high profile, um, you know, some criminal case where somebody's liberty is at stake and you want to be very careful to get it right, uh, you need to have somebody else proofread those for you. And I would say at the beginning, you should have somebody proofreading all your stuff for you. Just as the years go by when you start doing a thousand Puerto Rican vehicle titles. Nobody needs to proofread those because we, we could just type them out in our sleep with our eyes closed. But um, when you get a second proofreader, it should be somebody who is strong in areas that you're not, somebody who completes you. Somebody, let's say you are more of the literary type and this person is more of the pedantic type and they love catch, catching punctuation errors or maybe you're a native speaker of US English and she's a native speaker of Colombian Spanish and you, um, you notice things that the other person wouldn't notice, you can proofread each other's work or it could be a subcontracting position where you just hire her um, to proofread your documents on a per word basis as needed. But keep in mind that there's also a, uh, an emotional aspect here. We're all proud of our work. We all think that we're really smart and good at what we do. And so it's, it's humbling to have somebody else find mistakes that are legitimate mistakes. And it's a, it's a different kind of emotional stress for them to claim their mistakes when you believe they're not mistakes. And so you have to, as a, as a proofreader, you have to tread softly and try to make sure you don't overcorrect. If something isn't a legitimate synonym that you wouldn't have chosen, but it's okay, just leave it alone. If something is, you feel unjustified and you want to bring it up to the translator as a possible correction, just point it out in a polite way. And then when the shoe's on the other foot, you'll find that it's, it's a very different situation to be correct than it is to be doing the correct thing. And so whenever we have new, new uh, proofreaders that we're trying to break in, um, we start them on, on little orders and then give them feedback on their proofreading as, um, so that they can uh, be more of a team player and give the right level of feedback without giving too much. Nobody wants a translation that's just all covered with red uh, track changes when they get it back. If you are the proofreader and it's a terrible translation, on the other hand, you want to get out of that relationship. You don't want to keep proofreading for somebody whose writing is so bad that you have to spend more time correcting it than you would have had translating it yourself to begin with. So keep in mind who's signing the certification. It's almost always a translator himself or herself who signs the certification, but if the translator is overseas and somebody here is proofreading it and they need a, a wet signature on paper, then we might have the uh, proofreader um, take responsibility for certifying it. Sometimes the project manager does that as well if both of the other linguists are off-site. But just remember that whoever signs the certification is a person who has some legal liability or at least professional and ethical responsibility for an accurate translation. So never certify someone else's translation that you don't know. Once in a while, we'll have a customer coming in saying, oh, I'm bilingual, I've already translated. I just need you to put your certification stamp on there. And that doesn't happen, no. We, we might refer to their translation. It might 
save a little work, but we're going to start from scratch and translate it again and certify it because um, we know things about the process and about the languages and about the end user that are going to affect our, our word choice. And we want to make sure we produce a translation that has the highest possible chance of being accepted the first time and not being rejected because it doesn't comply with the expectations of that end user. And finally, if it's a large order, um, say it's a, a 100 page manual and they need it back next week, no single translator is going to be able to translate that in time to get to the proofreader, in time to get it back to the translator for changes to be accepted, in time you know, for final quality control and formatting within a week. And so it's going to have to be broken up between two or three translators. And maybe you'll be the lead translator and you'll subcontract out to some colleagues and assign them sections and everybody will collaborate and have a shared uh, glossary where you're keeping track of the terminology that you've chosen to use and there's a single proofreader over everybody who's going through and making sure that the style is consistent all the way through so those larger orders get to be exciting and stressful but that's also how you grow beyond the point of being a freelancer and a sole provider it's by starting to build teams and work with teams um, to handle larger documents and documents that require specialized skills maybe one of the per people on the team is just doing graphics and they're going through and opening in Photoshop all the JPEG images and putting in translations there and re-exporting them and putting them back in the document. And you don't know how to do that and you don't want to work on it, you want to work on just text, well that's fine because each person is assigned a responsibility and a project manager is supervising it. So if you um, do legal translations for the length of an entire career, you'll find yourself involved in more and more teams and uh, that's a good way to advance professionally. Um, so to to um, sum up, uh, as a court interpreter already, you have a, an impressive set of skills that you can continue to employ as a court interpreter, but there are other things that are open to you. Translation being one of them, you can teach, you can write, Doing things like voiceovers or dubbing or subtitling could also be thrown into the mix. Localization, um, performance, where you're maybe reading a text in your in in a different language than the original, or maybe you're you're um, interpreting the ASL of the text. Um, transcription work where you're taking audio information and putting it into writing. There are lots of other things that you can do with the skill sets that you already have. So consider not necessarily a career change, but a career growth, a career expansion from court interpreting into some of these other ideas. Um, but don't bite off more than you can chew to use an idiomatic expression that's tricky to interpret. Um, Start small. Take take a little something and work on it and see see what you think. See how it goes. And I would say as soon as you can, if you if you're going to be doing translation, find a proofreader on the small project that you're thinking it's just a little one page thing. I can look over this. I'm sure it's right. But if you go ahead and hire someone to proofread your work then you start to you can hire them for a tray of brownies to start out with yeah because uh, he works for brownies and see how they do see how you do see how you like each other working together what kind of feedback they give and that sort of thing so that when there is a bigger project you already know hey this is somebody i can work with i like the feedback they give me they like the feedback i give them they are punctual they they don't charge too much whatever whatever and and figure that out on the smaller things. You see a little bit lower, it says, pay your dues as a translator before managing larger projects. Figure out how you do on the smaller things before you take on huge things. Um, don't be the prescriptive perfectionist. Marco mentioned this earlier. There's not one way to say something in language A and language B. There, there are very few things that are exact equivalents. There are a few. But there are very, very few. And a lot of things can be said a number of different ways. And, and it's an art, it's not a science. And so be flexible in that. Teachable. Yeah. And speaking of teaching, we have a couple of resources down at the bottom. 
our blog and our YouTube channel where you can go to learn more about getting into the legal translation field or you can contact us. We're happy to help and uh, give you uh, suggestions based on uh, what we've learned. We enjoy what we do and um, are uh, happy to share more ideas with other translators and interpreters. Thank you for watching our show. <laughs> Have a good day.